We will start today on a course on political philosophy. Political philosophy is the follow-on course to ethics for Aristotle. Ethics and politics are complementary sciences or philosophies which together constitute a philosophy of human affairs. Politics is not that often studied, although ethics is, but for a true Aristotelian, as St. Thomas was, politics would certainly be an essential part of a philosophical education. If we turn back to the end of the ethics and look at Book 10, Chapter 9, we'll find Aristotle talking about the importance of politics for ethics, the importance of habit and law for cultivating in citizens virtue. He says, although people still argue whether we are made good by nature or habituation or by teaching, he said it is obvious that character does require nurture and therefore it's vital that from our youth up we've been brought up under the right laws because living temperately and courageously is not pleasant, he says, to most people. So nurture is something that our political community, according to Aristotle, would help us achieve. And at another passage, he says, legislators ought to stimulate men to virtue and urge them forward by the motive of the noble on the assumption that those who have been well advanced by habit will attend to such influences. So the next page we turn to the politics which gives an account of legislation and the political community. Aristotle of course sees politics as a practical science. It's not one of the theoretical sciences, along with ethics, the poetics, rhetoric. Politics is aimed at action. It is the study of human action. It's about contingent matters. It's not a science like physics. But he does think we can formulate basic principles, general formulas about what is best in politics. So the focus of this class will be on Aristotle and Aristotle's politics. In addition, we will read some of Thomas Aquinas. Although he did not write a systematic treatise on the politics, he did start a commentary on the politics, Aristotle's politics, which he did not finish, but like other themes in Aquinas we can find political philosophy throughout the Summa and other works. In addition we will be reading books by two of the greatest Thomist political philosophers of the 20th century, Jacques Maritain who should no, need no introduction to this audience since Professor McInerney is head of the Maritain Center. Maritain was friends with Yves Simone, who also wrote a classic book in political philosophy. And together, these two have the unique achievement of giving a Thomistic defense of liberal democracy, combining a modern sense of freedom with authority, putting together natural rights with natural law, seeking to combine the modern sense of equality with the ancient sense of virtue. So we will proceed by first analyzing Aristotle, the text of Aristotle, and then seeing how Maritain and Simone have taken these lessons from Aristotle and elaborated upon them to make a very powerful account of politics. Let's first look at an outline of Aristotle's politics. It contains eight books. Book one is about pre-political life, about family and economics. 
Book two is on the best regime, or what people have said is the most ideal regime. Book three is the key book, defining the concept of the political regime, talking about who is a citizen, and going through the various political arguments about who ought to rule. Book four is about political extremes and how to find the middle. Books five and six are about change or revolution in a political society. And he ends with books seven and eight on education, returning to the theme of virtue and the great theme of ethics. So let's now turn to book one, chapters one and two, which contain the opening principles of Aristotle's political philosophy. If we even start with the first paragraph, we will see he starts by defining the polis. Political science is about the polis. The polis is a Greek term that means city. It's not a state or a nation, but it's a unique achievement of the Greeks to have organized themselves under a constitution, respecting freedom and having the opportunity for political debate and deliberation. It's this phenomenon that's called the polis. Aristotle then says of the polis, it is that association which aims at the highest and most inclusive good. That is, the polis is like other human associations in that it aims at securing some good. The family aims at the good of children, the good of household necessities and keeping various functions going. Various clubs may have other aims or goals that they have. Aristotle sees the uniqueness about political association is that it aims at what is often translated the most sovereign good or the highest good. Again, that resonance with the ethics should be clear, just as ethics is the study of the highest good for the individual. Politics is about the highest good for the human community. Therefore, in Aristotle's mind, all other associations are in some way subordinate to or part of the political community. Sovereign here means highest or best. It is not primarily the meaning of power, although power is involved. It's a more modern notion to focus on politics simply in terms of power. For Aristotle, sovereignty means what is best, what brings out the highest in human beings. It is also the most inclusive because it embraces other communities, affects these other communities. So his first way to analyze the political association, though, is he will make three arguments that man is social and political by nature. That may be one of the most important axioms of Aristotle's philosophy as a whole, one of the most important principles of Thomistic philosophy. And it does stand in bold relief with modern philosophy and modern political practice, which seeks to start with the isolated individual. So let's explore Aristotle's great idea that man is a social and political animal. The first argument that he gives has to do from growth and development. Aristotle observes that the family arises by nature. He thinks it's obvious that male and female are attracted to each other, that, they, that their union will result in the reproduction and generation of human life. Aristotle says that it's part of 
being human, indeed part of being alive, the desire to leave behind the same nature as themselves. Now, one factor about the family is that it does deal with the satisfaction of daily and recurrent needs. It ministers to the necessities of life. Robert Capon has written a book called Bed and Board to talk about his theology of the family. Obviously, there's more to it, but that's the center has to do with necessities of life and the generation of life. The family is not complete. The family requires other associations to fulfill and complete its own work. So Aristotle next talks about the village. He said a village is an association of households aiming at more than daily needs and wants. He does not say a lot about the village. He would not presume to write a book entitled It Takes a Village, but he does think the village is very important. He sees it based primarily on kinship relations and often takes the form of tribal rule by the king or father. Why is the village incomplete? See, Aristotle's book would be entitled not that it takes a village, but that it takes a polis, that the family is insufficient and a village is insufficient. I think we could say that these associations start something which they are not able to fulfill or complete. The argument goes something like this, that the generation of life, the reproduction, the generation of a new human life aims at more than just mere life, but good life. That would be one of Aristotle's formulas, that the family comes into existence for life, but the political association comes into being for the good life, and that what would this entail? In part, it would require education. Now, I know there's been an interest in, in homeschooling, and the church indeed teaches that families are, parents are the primary educators of their children. But I think this must be balanced by the fact that the family doesn't have, normally, sufficient diversity, training, and achievement to fully educate their children. So by an Aristotelian account, it would be the function of the city to fully educate the child into the myths, the stories, the practical lessons, and various trades, and so on, that lead to the fulfillment or maturity of the child. In addition, Aristotle says that the family is devoted to preservation of life, but preservation of life also is incomplete in the family. Preservation of life requires greater commerce and division of labor. So normally a family is not able to produce all that it needs to preserve life. And certainly when we extend into questions of trade and even war, there's a greater community than the family that serves these functions. And that association would be the political society. So I think we could look at this in terms of generation of life, preservation of life as initiated by the household, by family, by parent, child, master, slave. We'll have to talk about what Aristotle says about this relationship, but he thinks they are devoted to preservation of life. But those must be extended to the point of achieving the good life and achieving a sense of justice. So that's his first argument that the political society is by nature, that we are by nature political beings. It goes something like this. If the family is by nature, what the family aims at must be completed by the political society. Therefore, political society must also be by nature. 
Let's go to the second argument. The second argument that he makes is that human nature is political because human beings cannot exist without a political society. Aristotle formulates a very powerful image when he says that without the polis, a man is either higher or lower than man. That is, he is either a beast or a god. A human must live in a political society. He says, normally, men without a political society are bad men inclined to war. It's, there's something about the political society which brings about the achievement of justice. It brings about impersonal and impartial law. There's something about the village which is open to arbitrary rule. I think of David Koresh or James Joan in Jonestown or these experiences of a family based upon a charismatic person which goes sour. Again, I think this is Aristotle's insight that man needs political society. A second aspect of this argument that man is made for the polis is that we have speech. We have logos, we have reason. So that great achievement of ethics, book one, chapter seven, that man is a rational animal, is also brought into play here. What does speech, why is speech connected to politics? His argument here is that we have more than voice. We do more than make sounds to communicate like other animals. We don't just bark or slap our tail or make a noise, but we are able to articulate what is just, what is unjust, what is good, and what is bad. Aristotle says it's this common perception of what is good and bad and just and unjust that precisely makes a political community. So we've got an essential function of man, his speech, leading to political participation. The third argument he makes is that the polis is prior to the individual. That is, the political society is more like a, a, a whole and the individual is a part. In the order of final causality, we could say for Aristotle, political society is the most basic cause. It is the achievement or perfection of being human. And again, he repeats the argument or the image that man is neither a beast nor a god. So to live without a political society would be either by someone who is so good they don't need others in a community, that would be the god, or someone who is not fit for human habitation, someone who is not able to live with others and is fearful. He ends chapter two by saying, man when perfected is the best of animals, but if he's isolated from law and justice, he is the worst of all. He goes on to say, without virtue, man is the most unholy and savage being worse than all others in indulgence of lust and gluttony. So justice, which is his salvation, belongs to the polis. For justice, which is the determination of what is just, is an ordering of the political society. I might just mention briefly that the image that man is neither a beast nor a god is retained in our own founding, in the Declaration of Independence. I think one way of understanding the claim that all men are created equal, the classical interpretation of that phrase, is we are created equal. It's a self-evident truth. How is it self-evident? If you understand the meaning of the terms. Here's the classical explanation. We understand that to be human is neither to be a beast nor a god. That's how we're equal. A god could rule us by his great wisdom and power, but no human can presume to be God. So we must consider ourselves equal on this fundamental level. 
Similarly, no one is like a beast. Lincoln uses this argument against slavery, that if we are equally human and no one is a beast or a god, it is most unjust to treat someone as if they were a beast. So the conclusion here, using Aristotelian terminology, is that political society is by nature. Its material and final causes are clearly by nature. The material cause being the family and the village, that natural inclination to, to family life, to reproduction, to kinship with others, and the final cause, the highest that we are made for by reason, virtue, those are by nature. And that's what politics will be about. We will see it also takes an efficient cause by a human legislator. And the formal cause will be justice and the embodied laws. Now, a word about Maritain. Jacques Maritain in a book, The Person and the Common Good, it's also found in some other writings, takes from Thomas Aquinas another variation on this theme that man is naturally a social and political being. Maritain says there are actually two roots of our sociability. The first one is out of our need, out of our deficiency. We are indigent creatures. We have physical needs, intellectual and moral needs. We are dependent on our fellows for the conditions of our existence and development as humans. Plato makes a lot of this same reason for sociability in the Republic, that no one is self-sufficient. We are needy beings, and so we are political by nature. It is a mythology to think we are complete individuals who then enter into political society by some kind of contract. The Aristotelian view is we are through and through social beings. But not only because of our deficiencies are we social beings. Maritain, as well as Yves R. Simone, will point to human plentitude or human perfection. In virtue of our dignity and perfections as humans, we are social by nature. Maritain says it's inscribed in our very ontological structure to seek, to communicate with others, to commune with others. He uses a term from Thomas Aquinas that the good is diffusive of itself. It's part of more than just a natural law, but a metaphysical principle that we must superabound. We must see our own good diffuse itself in communications with others of knowledge and love. Maritain says it's part of having personality, being a person, to ask for dialogue with others, to be with others. Again, to commune with others in knowledge and love. So by reason of our very spiritual personality, Maritain says, we are social by nature. Now this is a very important first principle for us to begin with, and it will be a very important first principle as we make further contrast with some modern political principles as found in Hobbes and Locke, who take as a first principle not our social and political nature, but war as our state of nature. Dissociation between man and man, fear, violence, as being the natural state in which we live. And therefore, political society for Hobbes and many modern accounts are artificial. They are constructs. There are no natural obligations or bonds. There are only self-interested contracts made by individuals. Of course, the great irony here of Hobbes and Locke is they leave out most of the population, children, who are not individual rational creatures, but obviously dependent upon others. So I think as we begin our reflections upon politics, we will find ourselves returning again and again to the great thesis 
outlined by Aristotle, that man is political by nature, and we are political by nature on account of our basic inclinations, our highest perfections, or as Maritain says, by our deficiency, as well as by our perfection. So let's end our first lesson, and we will turn next to the question of this pre-political part of society, the household, and see in a little more detail what Aristotle has to say about family, the vexing question of slavery, parent-child relations, and how in contrast to those, Aristotle will define politics. That is, political rule, political association, will be defined in terms of contrast to these other pre-political organizations, which although vital and part of the material cause of the political society, are not what is distinctively or formally political.